Hi, my name is Jeff, and this is Madeline Brennan. These are two of my teammates uh, for the Design Planet team of 2015, where we work on a social deception game made by a local indie game studio called The Origin Latitude 90. I won't dive too deep into the game mechanics specifically for the purpose of this presentation, but there are eight players at a minimum and two teams. Um, so some of the problems we encountered at the very beginning of sort of our client engagement is that they had done little to no discovery. They built this product entirely off of their own sort of personal experience playing social deception games, and they'd only played it exclusively with the same group of friends that they were building it with, which meant that they really had done no user research outside of that, their exclusive social circle. And when they came to us at first, they wanted us to dive straight into developing a native mobile app with what they had. So I believe that a UX designer and a product designer's job is to prevent product owners and developers from making horrible, horrible mistakes. <laughs> and that is exactly what we set out to do, and this is how we did it. So over 12 weeks, over 12 weeks and six sprints, we were actually able to conduct a fully agile workflow, so two-week sprints, where we used four key methods. Competitive analysis, playtesting, heuristic evaluation, and finally UI and brand design. So over the 12 weeks, we were able to transform a social deduction game from a web-based early alpha to a fully uh, native production-ready mobile experience. Now, in sprint one, we did competitive analysis really to validate the product's needs. We didn't really have any experience with the social deduction space prior to this, and we really wanted to see whether or not the product features that they were uh, pushing and pioneering had the sort of effect that they intended. So we really examined two types of games within the social deduction space. Mafia variations and a game called One Night Ultimate Hero. Without going too deep into the mechanics, two key characteristics that made the origin stand out, which is unique to it, is that it's a death-free game where users aren't unlimited aren't eliminated from the game as the game progresses, and that it's inclusive. Inclusive here meaning that every player has an equal chance to participate. In traditional social deduction games, often one or two players dominate the conversation, and more introverted players don't get to participate readily. So now that we had validated the product needs, we wanted to uh, launch straight into playtesting to iterate on the, uh, on the product and get more feedback. So this is five playtest sessions across six weeks, two continuous playtesting groups to truly get that sort of iterative feedback experience. And my team really went above and beyond to source and participate and moderate these playback sessions, going from North Quad to North Campus, all the way to the Renaissance Center in Detroit. And Excuse me, could you move to the oh, side? Right. Move, no, that's fine. I just want to be sure I get the full. Okay. And really what we found is that, you know, the most interesting feedback you can get is always going to be from a live product. And this is a quote we got from uh, one of our playtesters, is that the game is played out here. And that was really our key finding that social interactions were key in the context of this game. Because it was a death-free and inclusive experience, every member of the player fed off one of another and had a more enjoyable product experience as a whole. You know, people loved the game, but at the same time, we had some friction points, right? The UI had needed some work. There was lack of discoverability and clarity. And onboarding needed to be uh, streamlined because first-time users really had a hard time getting into the game because the onboarding cost was huge. Uh, so to solve for this, we did you know agile iterations. We were lucky enough to have a client that had the development skill set that we needed, so that every week we would be able to conduct a playtest session, take that feedback, translate it into <coughs> actionable design ideas that we would then pass to them, and they would then implement. So week one, week two, week three, whatever the users needed, whatever the feedback was, we would incrementally improve our product. So. At the end of uh, 10 weeks, we were, we're at sprint 5, we're doing a heuristic evaluation because it's finals week and we have neither playtesters nor the time to conduct these playtests. So we really wanted to affirm our findings uh, to see whether or not we'd be, uh, the playtesting findings were in line with everything we've done so far. So we conducted seven independent heuristic evaluations, we consolidated it into one document and found that the takeaway centered around system visibility and error prevention, which is directly in line with what we found in playtesting. So now, with this sort of confidence, we move into our final sort of design overhaul. And this UI redesign is important because we went from a traditionally web-based experience to a fully native mobile experience. And as you can see, the web-based stuff that we were prototyping and playtesting with is on the left, and the native stuff is on the right. So this is the in-game lobby that we changed. We changed from a scroll-based navigation to a grid-based navigation so that users could readily see everything uh, on the screen. We also changed from a uh, sort of uh, scroll-based navigation to a tab-based navigation so that users could more readily switch between specific activities and users had less of an onboarding cost because there was a clear set, uh, defined semantic quadrants for each individual uh, item. And we also changed notifications within the game so that they were more visually appealing and more usable so that users had visual cues for what each notification meant, not just from the text, but from uh, the uh, pictures. We also created an, uh, interaction maps for each uh, of these actions so that the developers in question would have not just a conceptual model, but a graphical medium to understand why we make these decisions. 
And during the last week, we also did brand design. Because previously, this was a web-based uh, project. They pulled a lot of icons from everywhere. And we designed all these icons ourselves so that we can inform their brand identity and also add more flavor to the game. Very good. Thank you very much, Origin. We appreciate it. We've come in front of you, picked up, judges, questions? Yes. <laughs> and they are still thinking. Oh, here we go. I'm um, just curious if uh, you use this agile with the company. Uh, what's your experience in, or challenges you see in terms of interpreting the design and the implementation at the same time? It's very fast. Yeah, so uh, it was definitely very challenging because there was uh, obviously very time-dependent issues, but our client was, um, I guess, motivated enough to always turn around our design items within three days. But you have to keep in mind that this was a web-based sort of element, so it was just HTML, CSS, and some JS. We actually wrote some code ourselves, but so that when we handed it off, it was the equivalent of doing iterative lo-fi prototyping in the context of a web-based browser. So delivery timelines weren't as pressured as they were, but it was mostly the scheduling of research and scheduling the design sessions immediately after that were our biggest questions. So what were the metrics you used? Because um, you sort of showed the pictures of people interacting in a group, but that's qualitative, right? So what are the game metrics you used to assess? Right, so we didn't do a lot of quantitative metricing. It was primarily qualitative. We did moderated sort of focus group style uh, feedback sessions after every uh, sort of game. But we did do video recording of each individual session. On top of that, we had a trooper in our team who just annotated every single video session. Each of these are four hours long. And so we could take these sort of qualitative quotes, uh, control after them to see how many times it was mentioned, and also take this to the client to have you know, sort of tangible understandings of why we need to make some changes. So the first case, the first cycle of an uh, agile development phase is always the hardest because, especially in the context of the game, by the time they're done with that first week, it's not going to be a fully functional game. So what was that first demo like? Um, so the first demo was actually we tested it. So it was really um, doing sort of some quick changes to make sure that it was better. In the context of this game, though, I think it's not as challenging. Because it is a social deduction game, and sort of the quote I put up earlier, the game's played out here. So it's primarily, the game's primarily played in the user's imaginations, and the phone plays more of a facilitator role, so it's not as demanding from the development perspective. So what, what gaps did you have to fill in that the first prototype could not do, that you had to kind of manually... I was coach? a walking rule book. Okay. Um, <laughs> At, at any point in time, right, as opposed to having like fully built out sort of tips and uh, sort of uh, a document within the game that users could easily access, any time a user had a question, uh, the entire team was basically a living walking document on how you proceed in certain use of hope. But it's also feedback for us saying this interaction isn't good enough yet. It's not intuitive yet. Okay. And did you explore any personas? And I want to give you a chance Sorry. to say what you want to say too. I just want to add on that like I think the key thing for us is when you watch new users start using it. Um, what the best part about this game was that people were vocal and you saw people who were starting to play not really sure what was going on when they first got introduced to it. And as we iterated over it and we made these changes, the onboarding process was much more streamlined. Like we did a lot of work on um, the copy and like making sure that this was clear what was going on because the rules were a little bit um, difficult to pull out. That was awesome. Persona exploration. Oh. Uh, we did not do persona exploration. Uh, because of the Agile model, we felt that the feedback we were getting every week was rich enough for us to move forward. Um, so it sounds like you focus uh, a lot on the mechanics of interaction, but I'm wondering to what extent you consider the culture of the players and the community because there could be some pushback if you're suggesting like, you know, you could change an icon or that. So I'm just wondering if any of those issues came up or to what extent you consider that as well. Um, there wasn't too much pushback on existing sort of icons just because they were stock icons to begin with. In fact, I think after we made the change to icons, they were received very positively because they informed more of the flavor of the game. In terms of community, there is definitely uh, a little bit of difficulty in terms of balancing interest between sort of power users who have played a lot of social deduction games and sort of first time users that were sort of just getting into the game. So uh, you're working with different levels of assumed knowledge and mechanics. Uh, and really we try to balance the game around uh, sort of the middle point of both so that uh, the more experienced players, because it's cooperative, could lead the less experienced players into an immersive experience. So you were working with an agile team of developers from the client, right? Correct. All three components. And how many were there? Uh, three, but only two were technical. Okay, and what was their involvement in the, in the UX process, and how were you able to include them as a partner in ideation, and, and how did that go off? 
Yeah, we actually did a lot of uh, brainstorming. We did a daily sort of client meeting with them at their office. One of the guys works at Fanzu Technologies down on Maine, and that's where we met once a week to talk through our research findings. I could always show them video clips and timestamps for when things uh, happen, and you know, when you show sort of like classic developer mindset is that they don't care, but when you can show them like a frustrating interaction on video with a quote, it's very, very powerful.